He said, you are not called to take care of yourself. We need to let that sink in. We are not called to take care of ourselves. Nowhere in the Bible says to take care of you. It says, cast your care on him. He knows how, much, how many hairs are on your head. So he knows what you need, right? Jesus never asked. Remember when Jesus, uh, and, and this is a little bit of my message, but um, he went to the feed the 5,000, right? But he went up on a hill. And he sat down. And he told his disciple to sit down. And what did he do next? He got the fish and the bread, right? And then what he did? He thanked. He never asked God to multiply that fish. Jesus said, if you want to be in his will all the time, give thanks in everything. Because it's, there's some of God in everything. So if you just give thanks, he'll multiply himself in everything. The Lord taught me that a long time ago. He said, Gene, I need to just give thanks in everything. And I still do it today when I put that gas in my car. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You notice when, when he fed, one, one area it says he fed uh, 4,000 and had seven loaves of fish, loaves, seven loaves left over. Then he said he fed 5,000 and had how many baskets left over? Twelve. That doesn't make sense. He fed 5,000 and had more left over. It tells you what God can do with a little. He just needs a little of you to do something. I'll get into that. So he said grace, I'm talking about being seated tonight, being at rest. You're in an apostolic ministry. You're supposed to be seated. And he said seated. You are not called. He said grace is multiplied when you're seated. That means you have to be out of the way. And I experienced that when, when I, I gave that testimony all the time about that big project I did, and it just went south. And I would not have this building. I would not have my home. I wouldn't have anything if God hadn't stepped in. And he told me, go home and sit. Keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to that. Rest is a lifestyle. Maturity finds, maturity finds the presence of Jesus and sits down. That's how you know you're mature. That you find the presence of Jesus and you just sit down. You are looking at me like I'm crazy. God wants you to, to be his lover, not everyone's answer. These are little nuggets I get. God wants you to be his lover and not everybody's answer. He said, Father loves you too much to give you what you have asked for until you learn to sit down. He said, if you are hungry for more, sit down. When he fed the 5,000, 
he sat down. Then he told his disciples to sit down. Then he told the 5,000 to sit down. We're, we're too busy. Too busy trying to please God. He said, we are not seated with him. He said, we are not, I can't even read my writing. We are not seated with him. We are seated in him. And as him. When we are restless, there's a lot of restless people. He said, when we are restless, we violate the seat. And the seat is where the authority comes from. He said, if you can get, if you can, if, if I can, if he can get you to sit down, he'll blow your mind. How many of y'all like to figure things out? Man, y'all need to be delivered tonight. I, I learned a long time ago, if I can't figure out, I just get rid of it. It's out of sight, out of mind. He said, you're not called to take care of yourself. I love that. So, if you're in the kingdom of God, it's all about change. And we hate change. We hate changing people. I hate when people leave because now everything's changing. But I've learned to love it because I've learned that he's the shepherd over all his people. Amen. We're just teachers. So he can do whatever he wants with his people. So I've learned not to hold on to people. So let's look at this. <clears throat> so even though you're saved, say saved, and born again, and filled with the Holy Spirit, the soul still needs to be saved from religion. Because even being a lost person, that's religion. Religion, the definition of religion is death is dead so if you look at this vision you have eternal life eternal life is where where is it at in you in your spirit carnal life abundant life every time you go through a test or a trial God is trying to get the carnality out of you there's a God in us that has trespassed and is lodged in the soul. Listen, if you think like the world in any area of your life, there's flesh still there. There's flesh still there. People can be ascended and not seated. I can be resurrected and ascended, but not seated. You can't be seated until you start thinking like him. So that's a sign that I'm not seated yet. I may be ascended. And you may not be ascended. You may be just resurrected. The ascended life is an abundant life. The resurrected life is a blessed life. It's only in the ascended life that you learn to sit down. Because in the sitting... You have authority. Where does the king sit? On a throne. When does he speak? When he's sitting. 
Have you ever seen a king get up and say something? He always sat on his throne. He spoke while he was sitting. I'm trying to get you into the mindset where God is taking you through this ministry is to be able to sit and speak and things are done. I don't know about you, but man, man, there were times I just got wore out from praying. I said, Lord, this can't be you. Wore out from praying. Desperate, crying out to God. Yelling and screaming at Him. Like He can't hear me. He's in me. He said, you're one step. See the darkness? You're one step out of darkness into more light. Just one step. Think about that. Just one step. You can be out of your trial. Just one step. You can be out of your, that temptation. All it takes is one step. And we stay in that place for years or weeks or months and and the reason we do is because we're trying to figure out what's happening. And the scripture says, his ways are past figuring out. You'll never figure it out. If you could figure it out, you wouldn't need him. If you could figure things out, then you're your own God. Here's one thing, just one of the many things the apostolic ministry does. It positions you to come into what has been out of reach most of your life. It positions you. I told people, you know, when you come into this ministry, God's going to bring into your life what's been out of reach for so long. For so long. But you have to do what the ministry teaches. That's the hard part for you. Do what we teach. And it will work for you. It will work for you. So, so how do you do everything we say? No, do what you have caught. Not what you hear. Do what you catch. Not what you hear with your outer ear. But like David said, I heard twice. So when you're hearing twice, you're catching it. So if you catch one thing tonight, that's what God wants you to do. So the apostolic ministry del delivers all of us from performance into romance. If you're in the church mindset, it's all about performance. In this church, it's not about performance. It's about romance. Romance. He said too many of us have become professionals when we were born to be a romantic. Too many of us become professionals when we were born to be a romantic. He said, I said, I thank God when I wasn't coming after him. And you can put that scripture up. I said, I thank God when I wasn't coming after him. He was piercing me through the lattice. Look at this scripture. He so beloved, but my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. So when I wasn't going after him, he was piercing through the lattice at me. He had his eyes on me the whole time. The whole time. Next verse. And my beloved spoke, and he said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That's the first thing you're going to have to do when you come into apostolic ministry and come into romance with him. You're going to have to come away from some people. 
You're going to have to come away from some people and get connected with him, just him. We're just here to connect you with him. He said, rest, is it, was that the last one? Yeah. He said, rest is a position. Now listen to this because it's going to be very important for you to understand. Rest is a position and a posture. So position and posture. Remember he said he's coming back for a bride who is prepared and ready. So he's coming back for a bride who is in position and in posture. So those two things means prepared and ready. So the vision there says there are many voices, loud voices, when you're on that threshold of change. Why? Why? Because the Holy Spirit will not be in competition with loud voices. Why? He said, because he doesn't want me to hear him from a distance. Y'all act like you ain't heard nothing like this before. He doesn't want you to hear him from a distance. Even though all these loud voices are distant, he's whispering. And he's whispering in this place right here when all these voices, outside voices. Man, I hate to see it when people are on that threshold and all the sons of the prophets come out. The sons of the prophets, the religious prophets come out and start speaking to them. Everything that's wrong with the leadership here. Everything that's wrong with everything we do. The, those, the, the sons of the prophets talked to Elijah, right? To get him to abort what he was about to receive was the mantle. I get the two mixed up. Elijah, Elijah. Elijah, yeah. Yeah, that was it. So God is trying to get a people. Listen to this. He's trying to get a people that will live so close to his face that they obey the whisper. They obey the whisper. If the desire came, listen to this, because the Bible says there's the desires of the heart, desires of the mind, and there's desires of the flesh. We want to make sure we, we've got the right desire before we ask for that thing to come to pass. He said, listen to this. He said, if the desire came when you were face to face with him, and what does that mean when I say face to face? Are you seeing his face? No. Every time the presence of God comes into this place, you are face to face with Him. You are face to face with Him. If your mind is still, you are face to face with Him. GSI, man, I tell you, the Lord called that thing. And you know what GSI means, right? God steps in. So while I was sitting there, and Charlena was giving her testimony, the Lord said to get them to bring the sick in. I can't do unusual miracles to people who don't need a miracle. So, so the next GSI is going to be focused on miracles. But you got to get some fresh blood in here that actually needs a miracle, an unusual miracle. So ask God to show you who needs to come and bring them in the place. So listen, <clears throat> he said, if you desire, if the desire came when you were face to face in his presence, then you can trust that that desire will not fail. He said, we can't live that close and not, and, and want what he doesn't want. We can't live that close to him and not want what he doesn't want. So when you're in his presence and he puts a desire in you or you see a vision, a dream, whatever it is, 
that thing is going to come to pass. But the key to it is you've got to remain in his presence. And how do you know that you're constantly in his presence? You're seated. You're at rest. You're at rest. He said, don't trust anything you want if it didn't come face to face. Look at Psalm 34. Psalm 37, 4. <clears throat> My God, make God the utmost delight and pleasure of your life. Who, who's done that? He's got to be the utmost pleasure of your life. And he will provide for you what you desire the most. How many of y'all have a godly desire? Like it's like it's lodged in your heart. It's not in your mind. It's not in your flesh, but it's lodged. It's taken up occupancy here. I asked God to take that desire away because I was so tormented by it because I didn't have enough revelation to be seated. And he said, I can't do it. Once I put a desire in your heart, it's eternal. It's eternal. He said, I don't change. Let's go to the next verse. Quiet your heart in his presence and pray. Keep hope alive as you long for God to come through for you. And don't think for a moment that the wicked and their prosperity are better off than you. Isn't it amazing how God God will let you see the wicked getting the high desires of their hearts met and they're prospering and all this kind of stuff? God is letting you see that. It's a test. What's the test? Not to complain. Don't complain what, what God is letting you see. Rejoice and give thanks in everything is what he says to do. Now listen to this. When a soul is at rest, it can only wait. When a soul is at rest, it can only wait. How did Abraham get the promises of God? How did Abraham get his desires met? Faith and patience. Faith and patience. When you're transitioning from a church mindset to an apostolic mindset, you're going to be the most impatient person you'd ever met. Because God is trying to get that out of you so that you can be patient and wait on him now he says delight yourself in him delight means soft pliable and dainty I didn't know what that meant dainty dainty soft pliable and dainty he said it's a bridal posture a term of intimacy and a term of intercourse a term of intercourse so What's happening in this vision between the spirit and the soul is an intercourse. There's a divine intercourse happening. If there's not an intercourse, there's not a conception. And if there's not a conception, there's not a new birth. I told Carl one time, I said, listen, next time you go through your uh, trial and you're testing call everybody and tell them to come to the birthday party because something new is birthing don't call them for help call them to rejoice with you call them to give thanks with you call them to praise God with you so listen rest means to be still and to be silent Wait and be astonished. How many of y'all like to talk a lot? Rest means to be still and silent. (laughs) 
this is not on the PowerPoint, I don't think, but, but PowerPoint's fixing to show up. So the Lord said to this, listen to this. He said, we are making the shift <clears throat> from information being processed from religious culture and being pierced with revelation versus information and a kingdom expression. Well, that's a lot. Oh, Lord, I, I, I don't have all the revelation of that. He said, we are making it a, the shift from information being processed from a religious culture and being pierced with revelation versus information and a kingdom expression. Now that's going to be a messy for somebody. I don't, I don't have the revelation. Huh? Expression. So the Father has better plans for you than you do for yourself. Isn't that good? But you have to sit down. So here's the PowerPoint. Sit down. Sit down. So, so when you're dead in your sins and trespasses, you're lying on the floor dead, right? And then all of a sudden Jesus comes along and you get resurrected. And the next thing you got to do is sit down after the resurrection. So after resurrection, there's an ascension and then you have to sit down. So many things that God wants to give you and do for you is not going to come in the resurrection. It's not going to come in your prayers. It's going to come when you sit down. A man who is sitting down is at rest. You can't move him. You can't get him off of it. People have tried to move me on things. They've tried to justify things. Man, you, you're not going to move me. I'm sitting down. It's so true. I am sitting down. And I'm seeing and I'm hearing and I'm saying like a king should be. A king sends out decrees. Lambs cry. Sheep do what? What's a sheep sound like? All kind of noise, right? All kind of noise. But a true king is going to be seated. And his mind is at rest. His mind has been sanctified. Jesus said, I will sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. But who sanctifies the mind? Think about that, because the mind is the mediator between the spirit and the soul. It's the mind that's in trouble. The mind is the battlefield. Can you be seated? You can't hear unless you're seated. You'll hear many voices when you stand up. But when you're seated, you're going to hear one voice. And that's all you're going to say. Because your mind has been transformed. Now, I can be seated and standing at the same time. Man, I'm so excited about this youth here in this kind of revelation. They might not understand it, but man, it's going inside of them. Charlie, I missed you. We're on the doorway of change. The goal, say the goal is to enter his rest enter his rest that's the goal 
Let's look at Hebrews 3.7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, today, if you will hear his voice. So disobedience will keep us out of his rest. How many of y'all have an anxious mind recently? Well, raise your hand. I mean, the Lord, he's looking at you. He's... I'm going to give you some revelation on the anxious mind in a minute. So listen, Hebrews 3.18 says, Do not harden your hearts as, a, as in the rebellion in the day of trial. That's the day of trial. So Hebrews 3.14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold from the beginning our confidence and steadfast to the end. Hebrews 3.15, Today, he said, He's talking about today now. If you will hear his voice, don't rebel tomorrow. Don't rebel tomorrow. Let's look at Hebrews 3, 18 and 19. He said, so God swore on an oath that they would never enter his rest, his calming place of rest, all because they disobeyed him. So it's clear that they could not enter their inheritance because they wrapped their hearts with unbelief. What is an inheritance? Who can tell me what an inheritance is? I've talked about inheritance a lot in this ministry. Who can tell me what is, what is our inheritance? An inheritance is something that you didn't ever work for. It's inherited. A person who is sitting is a person who has died. Their only identity is in Christ. Now they can receive the inheritance because of the death and burial of the old man. If you're still thinking like the old man, you're not dead. If you knew and could see what your inheritance looks like. Man, you'd die right, near, right here in this place right now. If you could just see it. I've tasted the inheritance. I don't have the full inheritance, but just the taste of it has blown my mind. There's no struggle. There's no worry about money. There's no worry about, listen, if you're, if, if, if you're still worrying about pay the, paying the rent, you're not seated. Everything's already done to die. To die to your ways to die to your thinking to die to, to everything that you know listen if, if you've received anything that's common it's not from him let that sink in if you've received anything that's common it's not from him so let's go to the next verse so, so now the promise of entering into God's rest is still for us today. So we must be extremely careful to ensure that we all embrace the fullness of the promise and not fail to experience it. For we have heard the good news of deliverance just as they did. He's talking about the Israelites. Yet they did not join their faith with the word. Instead, what they heard didn't affect them deeply, for they doubted. Faith comes by hearing the revealed word of God. Faith comes by hearing. He said our responsibility is to join faith to the word. You have to join it. Faith does not join it. 
faith comes. Everything is in submission to your will. You have to choose to join faith to what you heard. You have to choose it. So how do you do that? I have to choose to believe. That word. Now faith is mixed with it. And it's going to happen. It will happen. I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a testimony. This is how the word of God gets rooted in us. Now let's look at Hebrews 4.3. He said, for those of us who believe faith activates the promise and we experience the realm of confident rest. For he has said, I was grieved with them and made a solemn oath. They will not enter into my rest. God's works have been completed from the foundation of the world. So who couldn't enter into the rest? Those who disobeyed the word. So if the opportunity was there to obey it, you were standing on the threshold of entering his rest so that you could receive a portion of your inheritance. Inheritance is given in measure. It's a measure of inheritance. Something you never worked for comes to you. So Hebrews 4.4 4 says, For it says in the scriptures, On the seventh day God rested from all his works. Jesus came as a permanent Sabbath rest. He's a permanent Sabbath. Listen, when you're seated and you're at rest, your Sabbath is every day. It's every day. It's a rest every day. God worked six days and rested on the seventh, and he never went back to work, right? I said that in GSI yesterday. He never went back to work. Hebrews 4.10 says, As we enter into God's faith, rest life, we cease from our what? Works. So what is he saying here? Not to work anymore? When he says to rest, does that mean be lazy? What is he saying? Talk to me. What is it? He says, cease from your own works. What is he saying? Cease from doing things that I didn't say to do. Jesus only did what he saw and heard the Father do because he was seated. Next verse. Those who first heard the good news of deliverance failed. Is that the same verse? Those who first heard the good news of deliverance failed to enter into that realm of faith's rest. Look what it says. It says faith rest. Faith's rest. Is faith supposed to rest? And why is it resting? When we're supposed to live by it. Faith is a motivator. But here it's resting. Why is it resting? What caused it to rest? He said the end of faith comes to an end at the salvation of the soul. So a man that's seated 
his soul was whole. Because he doesn't need faith anymore to make it whole. So faith is resting. So when faith is resting, the promise is released. God opens up his hands. It's released to you. It comes to you. Let's go. Unbelief is in the soul. Let's, let's all agree to that. Even though we fail the test and trials, the opportunity still remains to interface rest. The opportunity is always going to be there. Let's look at Hebrews 4, 7. It says God still has ordained a day for us to enter into, into called today, for it was long afterwards that God repeated it in David's words, if only today you would listen to his voice and do not harden your hearts. There is an ordained day of opportunity to enter his rest. Now, when is that day? When is that day? Look, look, look at this. No, it's not today, unless you're in this trial. See, rest? But it's always available. It's always today. It's always there. Rest. After rest, what happens? You receive. Blessings are back here. Inheritance is over here. Blessings are really for repentance. Inheritance is for sonship. So what is the difference between a son and a glorious son? The glorious son, not only is at rest, but he carries the glory of God. So what makes him glorious is God's glory on his life. And God's glory is seen by the acts of God on his life. It's the acts of God on his life. Ordain means to establish by appointment. Isn't it amazing that God's appointment is disappointment? How many of y'all been disappointed lately? Then you're right in line with God's will. What is disappointed? Why does God want us to be disappointed? He wants to reveal a weakness. It's an appointment for a revealing of a weakness that's blocking your inheritance. It's blocking the inheritance. How many of y'all have dealt with anger before? Everybody. What's attracted to anger? Disappointment. Disappointment. Anger is attracted to disappointment because dis uh, anger is a weakness. So God's trying to show us and disappointment, that's the problem. Your anger makes you think you're strong. But that is your weakest moment. The devil's trying to get the last word in anger. That's your weakest moment. Hebrews 4, 8 and 9, let's see what it says. Now, if this promise of rest was fulfilled when Joshua brought the people into the land, God wouldn't have spoken later of another rest yet to come. So we conclude that there is still a full and complete Sabbath rest waiting for believers to experience. Now, the full and complete Sabbath rest is your Sabbath every day. 
That's every day. So the full and complete rest on the other side of the appointment. Jesus, Jesus said in 4.10, Hebrews 4.10, he says, As we entered into God's faith, rest, life, we have ceased from our own works. He's giving me that verse again. He wants us to see something here. What does he mean to, to, that you have ceased from your own works? What does it mean? Then he said it's no longer doing your thing, but you're, you're doing God's thing. So you're going to be doing your thing until you're seated. Because it's only when you're seated that you have ceased from your own works. And then you're going to feel like, man, I'm not doing nothing. But everything's happening. It's real. So then we must be eager to experience this faith rest life so that no one falls short by following the same pattern of doubt and unbelief. So Satan works in patterns where God works in cycles. He said a pattern is a model Cycles are reoccurring success in, successions for change. Write that down. Reoccurring successions for change. So if you're in a pattern of thinking, then you know that you're outside of his rest. Hebrews 4.12 says, For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy like a two-mouthed sword. Now I'm going to ask you what that means in a minute, so be thinking about that. It will even penetrate to the very core of your, our being where the soul and spirit and bone and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secrets and motives of the heart. So you cannot be here unless you had received here the living word, the rhema word, the unveiling revelation of the word. Because when it gets here, it's piercing everything. So what does it mean when he says it's a, it's a two-mouthed sword? There, there's two mouths on it. On one side of the sword, God speaks. On the other side, you speak. So that's why we tell people, when you're in this trial of testing and temptations and all this kind of stuff, say what God told you here. Whatever that word was, that's all you have to get through this trial. And, some, and people will say, well, God didn't give me a word. He gave you a word. You would not be in the situation you're in right now. He's always going to give you the victory before you enter into a defeated situation. Because the, the victory is already there. It's already there. You need the, the word of God. He said the trials are to remove what the revealed word has separated. So the revealed word is separating all the sin that's attached itself to your soul, to your bone, to your marrow. Marrow represents blood. It's separating. The trial is supposed to get rid of it too. And the word takes its rightful place. And when the word takes its rightful place in the soul, you're going to experience a measure of rest. You're going to come into a rest. Now, rest is different from peace. 
I cannot be in a dominion state if I'm not in relationship with God. How can he trust somebody that can't hear him? And you can't really hear him clearly unless you're seated. That's why you had to have confirmations. After confirmation. After confirmation. Because you're still an infant. Infants need confirmations. Sons don't. Sons hear clearly. And they say and do. So the sword of the word is for trials. <clears throat> the word is like a two-edged sword speaking to God. The agreement with what God said becomes a two-edged sword. When we speak what God said, it penetrates. Penetrate means, I love this, penetrate is the key word. It means pass through. It's passing through. So when, when we confess the word in your trial and your testings, the word in that trial begins to what? It travels to penetrate the spirit, soul, the bone, and the marrow. It's, it's, a, it's traveling. You don't even realize it's doing it. All you're doing is confessing the word. You're just confessing the word. And that thing is traveling at your confession. He said the word penetra penetrates immaterial parts and material parts of our existence. As the word penetrates, it reveals and exposes the lie, disguising itself as truth. Ephesians 5.11 says, don't even associate with the servants of darkness because they have no fruit in them. Instead, re reveal truth to them. This is the fruit of darkness. That you want to reveal the word to them by saying it. Jesus said, my words are, are spirit and life. So that means light. Light cast out darkness. If you'll just confess the word of God, it will cast out the darkness in the soul. Because something in the soul right now is being judged as a trespasser. So when your trial comes and you're full of fear, fear is being judged as a trespasser. Because it's taken the place of the word of God that he revealed to you. And you can't have the word. You, I mean, you have to have the word to enter into his rest and to receive your inheritance. The only way that you know you have become the word of God is you don't think on nothing that's contrary to the word. write that down the only way that you can judge yourself have I become the word that you don't think on nothing that's contrary to the word so in other words you're going to have all these thoughts because the devil keeps throwing those darts but when you start thinking on one of them then you have not become you're still old. You're still operating as the old man. So, he said to expose them. Let's, so don't have fellowship with demons. Instead, reveal the truth to them. So I, this is my, 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 one of my favorite verses, Ephesians 5, 13 and 14, which really is the foundational verse for the spots class. For, so whatever revelation light exposes, it will also correct everything that reveals truth as light to the soul. Didn't say to the spirit, so he's dealing with the soul. All right, so this is why the scripture says, Arise, you sleeper, rise up from your coffin, and the anointed one will shine his light 
into you. Into you. So we should be rejoicing when hell shows up. We should be rejoicing when hell is exposed in me. Instead of complaining. Instead of bickering and having an attitude and all this kind of stuff. God is trying to get rid of something that's contrary to his likeness in you. I want to be like God. I want to be just like him. In thought, word, and action, I, everything, I just want to be just like him. Because I'm going to struggle outside of that. Don't have fellowship with demons. Rest is important to God. So he says in Hebrews 4.11, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Where, when, when does diligent place its call? When is diligent placing its call on you? And the trial. Okay, so you all still with me, right? Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So the key word is diligent. Diligent means what? Painstaking. <clears throat> Painstaking. It means energetic effort. Painstaking means driving your pain into the ground. So your pain was crucified, right? But you have to bury it. Jesus didn't bury it. He crucified it. He crucified the old man. So he's still on the cross pain, full of pain. You have to bury it. You have to bury it. So who's digging the grave? Other people. Is there somebody just around you just irritating you like, ah. It's your season for burial. And what keeps the, 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 him digging that grave is you loving him. Because the Lord said, love your enemy. Because he's digging your grave. And you're going to bury that man of old and never see him again. Never have to deal with that personality again. Never have to deal with that character again. But instead we want to complain about the one that's irritating the heck out of us. Isn't that true? We want to complain about him, talk about him, gossip about him. And that stops us digging. Then you got to start over again, digging that grave. Drive your pain into the ground. So in other words, bury it. Jesus crucified the old man, but you must bury it. Everything buried will be resurrected into the new nature. So everything you bury will be resurrected into a new nature, into a new thing in your life. Because the old nature actually carries something, but it's been prostituted. It's been prostituted. So the rest, then the rest comes, then the ascension comes, seated and standing at the same time. So how can you be seated and standing at the same time? Talk to me. If I'm seated in this chair, how can I be standing at the same time? You what? Talk to me. Where's my ministers? You should know. How can you be seated and standed at the same time? You're not standing, you're seating. Stand still and wait. That's a good answer. <laughs> That's a good answer, babe. 
I'm going to get to that. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the importance of rest. God places a higher a priority on entering his rest. First, we are called to into fellowship with his son. Then we are to reign with him. The reason most of us are sick, broke, busted, disgusted Christians is because we matured in the resurrected life and never entered into the ascended life. Any part of your life that you don't allow for growth gives the enemy ground to come in to place his stuff on you. So when remember I talked talk, talk to you about the five mindsets of Christ. The church mindset, the kingdom mindset, no, the servant the church mindset, the, the servant mindset, the kingdom mindset, the bridal mindset, and the glory mindset. Those are the five mindsets within the mind of Christ. Most of the church is in the church mindset and the slave mindset. The church is still a slave to Christ. When he said in the scripture, move from being a slave to a son. So he wants you to move from uh, the gifts being a slave to you and you being a slave to the gifts. Because if you don't allow for for the kingdom to come in you're going to end up being a hireling now you're going to be really miserable I'd rather be working uh, as a lost man than, than working a gift that has no room for promotion into the kingdom A kingdom is saying, a kingdom mindset is saying that you are now a son. So what does that tell you about people with giftings? They're still a child. And the gifting has deceived them to think they're mature. Because the gift is mature, but the person carrying it is not. If we don't leave room for transition into the different mindsets of Christ, we're going to get stuck, and the devil's going to put sickness on you. He's going to put debt on you. He's going to put all these things on you to keep you held back. That's why we wrote that book, What's Holding You Back. But we need to go into a glory mindset. That is the last mindset of Christ, the glory mindset. So rest. Most Christians are in a resurrected state but not a ascended state. Some have reached the ascended state but aren't seated. What happens when you reach an ascended state and you're not seated? What happens? When I've reached, reached an ascended state, that means I've, I've moved past my resurrected life to an ascended life. But if I'm not seated, what happens? Pride. Pride comes back in. Being seated is a picture of humility. A prideful person wants to stand. So that's being ascended but not seated. Like the proud conqueror. So when, 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 when you are seated in his rest, you will begin to inherit the multiplication you were designed for. If you still have anything that is common, it didn't come from being in him and he in you.
So anything that you are used to didn't come from him. Because everything in him and everything him in you is new. It's uncommon. You could have never done it through the old man. You could have never loved common. That's common love. We're talking about God, man. We're talking about the God of love. If we just focus on how much he loves us, that'll cause you to rest. Because he cares for us. He knows what you need before you ask. Isn't that amazing? He said, I already know what you need before you ask me. So why did he say that? He doesn't want your, you to waste your time asking. He wants you to waste your time Romancing. He's the lover of your soul. He said if we experience multiplication now before rest, you will have to strive to sustain what brought the multiplication through self effort. That's strong. So that's a man that has ascended and multiplied but never rested and never sat down. You're going to have to work it. I'd rather Jesus work this vineyard than me. He just wants me to love him. He said, you just love me. I'll work your vineyard. And you will partake of that fruit. You will eat those grapes. You will eat that new, drink that wine. So, this is getting better. So, rest was never intended to be circumstantial. Rest was intended to be a secondary consequence of encountering his presence. Rest was never to be intended on what's going on around you. Rest is a prophetic declaration of what's going on on the inside of you. People say to me all the time, I'm glad you're stable. Because everybody around you is not. A man who is stable is seated. That's how he can stand and sit at the same time. He's stable. He's, he doesn't move by the emotions. He's not moved by emotion. Rest was never to be intended on what's going on around you. So look at, listen to this. This was a revelation. Anxiety and fear and worry serves as a witness that we have perverted relationship with time. Anxiety and fear and worry as a witness that we are future tripping when we choose it. Do you see that? So anxiety and fear and worry is saying you are future tripping into your future prematurely. That's why he said don't worry about this or that. He's going to do it, but you're tripping into it. We're tripping into it. When anxiety, fear, and worry, we're tripping into something prematurely in the future that he has not built his character in you to sustain. So listen to this revelation. We feed future trouble by leaving present grace. Grace is for today. When we leave it, 
And the sign of leaving grace is fear and anxiety and worry. You just left grace. Now you're actually feeding the trouble for you for tomorrow. He said we lose our peace by going backwards. Oh, and he just said and forward prematurely. So when I see a person losing their peace, they've gone backwards, right? Or they've gone forward without the trial. They tried to go over the wall instead of through the wall. Jesus said we had to go through the wall, not go over the wall. It takes a long time to chip through a wall. And why did he do why did he say you got to go through the wall? Because by the time you get through that 12 inch cement wall, there ain't gonna be no more flesh left. And you're gonna fall right into your rest. <laughs> you had a, bypassing this. She asked, what's the example of going over the wall? Not going through the trial. Not going through the conflict. Because you can back up and forfeit going through the trial. And then a person, become, he'll try to, this is what a person will do, trying to get his desires met. He'll step in the future prematurely and anxiety and worry is always a sign that the trial has not showed up yet to build the character. Trials are for character. Trials and testing is for character building. It's a, it's a divine exchange. Leaving your character and gaining his character. So as I tell everybody, you'll pass all these little tests. It's character building, character building, character building, character building. And then the final exam comes and you feel like you hadn't passed anything. Because the final exam is for the validation and the establishing of the permanent character of Christ when you pass that final exam. That's how it works. So Mary and Martha were in the exact same presence in the room with Jesus, right? They were both there. His presence caused one to sit down and caused the other one to get busy. Isn't that right? Let's look at this in Luke. So now while they were on their way, Jesus entered into a village called Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister named Mary who seated with herself at the Lord's feet and was continually listening. So one was standing and one was sitting. So you can be in his presence and stand and sit at the same time. You can be in his presence and stand and sit at the same time. So he can actually get you busy doing something while you're resting. He was showing us a picture of being able to stand and sit at the same time when you're seated. You see it? But Martha was very busy and distracted with all other serving responsibilities and she approached him and said, Lord, is it of no concern to you that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me and do her part. But the Lord replied to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. But only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part and that which is to her advantage, which will not be taken away from her. Your seated position will never be taken away from you. 
It will never be taken away from you. Being seated is an advantage that you can hear him clearly. She heard him. Chaotic does not move a person into rest. Everything that comes your way is a witness of more rest. Everything that comes your way should be a witness that rest is, is building in you. So listen, rest is the position for inheritance. As long as there is a measure of restlessness, we are not in a position for inheritance. How many of y'all get restless? Just be honest. Listen, if you be honest, God will help you. If you're not honest, he ain't going to help you. Because he's not going to strive with pride. So God said, there are resources he cannot give until we are seated and standing at the same time. He said, if you can get past the fear of taking care of yourself for the next 10 years, you can leverage something that you are in the moment of. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's a revelation right there. Everybody wants to take care of themselves for the next 10 years. He said, but if you can leverage the moment you're in right now, you have enough for generations. Lord Jesus, come on, help us. That is realist. You leverage the light. So, so when the enemy puts on your mind that you got to take care of yourself, you are operating out of the old nature. It's cursed. So now you're going to have to work it, and you're going to have to work it, and you're going to. And knowing that the light is at hand right then. If you can leverage your thinking and not think that way, light will shine on your darkness. And those thoughts won't come back. Because light expels dark thoughts. Dark thoughts are you saying, I got to take care of myself. Nowhere in the Bible it tells us to take care of ourselves. Man, he'll give you stuff to do that's in his will that will make you so content so that you can wait and be patient. He'll keep you busy with ministry. He'll keep you busy doing his work. He'll keep you busy coming in here every day to worship. The gladness of your heart. So remember, there's desires of the mind, the flesh, and the heart. It's the desires of the heart that he'll keep you glad with until he meets that desire.